which shows you all the research for 20 years of American top athletes and their world trials, and it shows the top athletes have already basically at 4.8 strides per second on step two of the race, and it stays all the way through, it goes from 4.8 to 5, so just under five strides a second between them and the end. So your stride frequency is almost all the same, it's just your stride length that gets longer because you get faster, and um, your ground contact time decreases, and that's it. So, taking the Usain Bolt's model again and looking at these things, you can see his shin angle, how it's changing throughout the race. You can see his torso angle, how it's changing throughout the race. And you can see the rate change in velocity, how that's changing. So that's why it's really important to get the start and transition phase right, because once you're upright, you set everything up for the rest of the race. What you've got to do is kind of stay upright, put your foot underneath this little mass so you go up in the air, and then try to use all the elastic components of your body to do that, so you don't get tired. You use your muscles to do it, so you don't get tired. Usain Bolt's very good because he uses all his elastic energy to create that last little bit of the race, rather than his muscle energy, and that's why he doesn't drop off in speed very much. But we're just going to focus on this real quick here. Okay, so that's the, I was originally going to get us to put our guesses out for everything, but that's basically what happens. Yeah, and so, if you look at those stats, I can't believe that anyone thinks to begin a race isn't important for 100 meters. And, and I didn't think it was as important when I started coaching. I didn't think it was as important until about four years ago. And I'd already been coaching six or seven years by that time. So, looking at what you're actually going to look at as a coach, it's really easy. Just look at the centre of the mass, where their hips are, and then look at where their foot is. Okay? If the foot is behind the centre of the mass, then the velocity will be, uh, sorry, the angle of the force production will be more horizontal. So, coming out of the blocks on the first step, the Foot is behind the centre of mass. And this is if you're a world class athlete. We'll talk about what happens if you're maybe not quite as good. Your foot is behind your centre of mass in terms of where it is, and the angle of the shin is like this. And the second step is like this. And slowly the shin angle increases until you get to the point where the shin angle is vertical to the track. And that means that the foot is basically landing pretty much below the centre of mass, maybe slightly behind it. But notice that the trunk angle is still leaning forwards. So that's maybe six to seven degrees per stride in terms of shin angle. And in terms of your body incline, it's, it's increasing maybe a little bit less than that, maybe 1-2%, one, 1-2 two one, two degrees so. Then in your transition phase, which is the next phase, your shin is always in the track in the same position. And all that's changing is your body angle is coming up. This is where you get that lovely kind of like view of the athletes kind of taking off in the race. So as a coach, you literally have to look at your shin angle and what the torso is doing for those two phases. So they're coming out of the blocks. Let's just look at him because he's over here. Look at where his uh, foot's landing. How close is that to the line? It's really close. World class sprinters, the better sprinters have their foot landing, the first step of the race landing close to the line than less good athletes. He is like six foot four and he lands 50 centimeters from the Start one, which is really, really close if you've ever tried to do it. So, you know, I'm, you know, if I was to do it, I'd probably land immediately from the start line. Does that mean I'm better than using Bob? No, because if I'm landing in front of the start line, my shenanigans is pointing that this way back towards me, I'm slowing down my first step. Whereas he is landing behind himself, so he's going to create force forwards, which is exactly what he wants to do. So look at the position of his foot when it lands. Okay, next step. You see how the, it's, it's difficult to tell from the slide, but still that shin angle is pointing forwards more. Okay? And remember, the, the diagram I'm showing you is ideal. It's not like everyone does it, and he's better on one leg than he is on the other. But you still get the basic idea. Look how his torso is doing behind. Okay, step three. See when he lands, it's still pointing forwards. See, still slightly forwards. Five, six, seven, and it's difficult for you to see here. But if your foot lands behind the center of mass, you're creating force this way. So you've got a big force vertically and a big force horizontally. So your overall force is at 45 degrees, let's say. There's your center of mass. Because your foot lands behind you here, it makes you rotate. Creates a rotation force forwards. Okay? You kind of, you're gonna, if you land behind yourself, you're going to step in front of you natural yourself because your 
and then rotate forward towards the ground. That's important to know when we talk about why the arms are important in the beginning of the race. So, create you, cause you to rotate forward, so your leg out the back, and also your back arm pushing up. So your back arm does this, you rotate towards the floor, your back foot does this, you rotate towards the floor. On the opposite side of the equation, your front knee is doing this, making you rotate backwards, and your front arm is doing this, making you rotate backwards. And if these happen together, you will stay in the, in the equal amount, you will stay in this, this angle. That's important when we look at people stumbling out of the box. At top velocity, maximum velocity, it's the opposite. You've got massive vertical force and a very, very small horizontal force. Um, uh, sorry, massive vertical force and a very small horizontal force. Okay. Final thing to talk about is you remember I said that the stride, length, stride rate out of the box is really quick and it doesn't seem like it makes any sense. Well, the reason that happens is because when you come out of the box at the start of the race, your heel basically comes up quite quite close to your body, quite low to the ground, comes up quite low, and then you get your foot down quite quickly. So it doesn't take you very long to hit the floor again. Okay? So this time here is the same as it is when you're going up high, and it's coming all the way up and coming, it's coming all the way up here, and then coming back down. It's basically the same. And in fact, the better athletes try and get their feet back down to the ground quicker. They're not taking just more for stride length, because the stride length is totally related to how fast you're going, the stride length is actually quite big, but relative to them, they're getting their feet down as quick as they can. And the less good athletes, and it's cycle the hill up like this, and then they come down, you'll see that in some of the videos that I've got, and that will slow them down. They won't be able to get their feet down as quickly, so they won't be able to produce force again, as round as early as other person will, and they won't be able to travel forward as quickly. So two things that really make a difference. straight line from head to toe for your body and at maximum knee flexion here okay, the angle of your, um, your free leg should be about how level of the back leg out of the box okay. so if you're coming out of the blocks you've got this back the straight line from here and the other foot like this and this leg is going to land in front of your body and therefore the shin angle of ground contact is not going to be as negative as you want it to be so you're not going to go so it as rapidly as you can do. Okay. And actually, if you think about it, what does that look like? It looks like a high jump, doesn't it? So if you want to direct forces vertically, you put your foot in front of yourself and you high jump over the bar, whereas we're trying to go forwards as rapidly as possible, not up. So it makes sense that you wouldn't want to put your foot out in front of yourself in that. Okay, so you're going to try and look at the point of the knees and the mat from the angle of flexion, look at where the foot is, look at what the shin is doing, and if the shin's like this, which is really on some people, then the chances are they're going to land in front of themselves, or at least not as close to this kind of match as they can be. Okay, that's why this, this little thing here says don't let your legs spring out. Okay, you don't want your athlete to be going here, kicking out, and coming down when you're still the bottom just come here, and push straight back into the floor. This video. Well, on his own, without anybody up there, that's there, you can watch him do a block start, okay? So it's a beautifully clear video and because it's a blue track, he's got dark skin, you can see exactly what's going on, it's really easy. Okay, so this is his coach. Look at the angle at which his shins are pointing when he starts on the blocks. That's the angle he's going to produce force against the block. Which for him is going to be slightly less than 40 degrees, probably about 40 degrees for him. I haven't made it here specifically, so I can't get the like, exact footage. But basically, he's here and he's pushing out of the blocks. Okay. Now, he is not the best person in the world at this, but look, you see his heel, it's not rising that high towards his butt, it's not coming like, it's not like right up here. And in fact, his top athletes actually have the angle here of their knee is bigger than, than, than the lower level athletes at this start of the race, because they're trying to keep their foot as close to the floor as possible. So look, his shin's almost vertical, well, pretty much horizontal to the track, so when it's pulled through, it should stay pretty much horizontal to the track, it shouldn't be going like this. <coughs> Also look at his lead hand. You see it's above his head. This is the most single biggest reason why most people kind of stumble out of the box and struggle. Because he's pushing backwards, so he's creating a big forward rotation. If he doesn't, and his back arm's going back, so he's creating a big forward rotation. His front knee is going to drive forward, so that's going to create a rotation in the opposite direction. If his hand doesn't come up to above his head, he 
he's basically going to fall forwards out of the box, he's probably going to stumble on the next drop. So it's important when the athlete comes out of the box to have my high hand and as well. So you can see that. And look at the point of maximum knee flexion. See how the shin is power? Okay. Now watch this foot. You see it doesn't swing out? It's dropping towards the floor because his, his left contact the block, so he's got his, his gravity going towards the floor. But look at the direction his foot is travelling. He's travelling back towards the floor. And look where it's landing. This is one metre from the start line. Okay. You can go and look on any track and see where Bob's foot's landing. And remember, he's six foot four. And you can look at your athlete and notice that they're landing over here, and you can go, okay, there must be a reason for that. His stride length isn't that long, but because he's pushing backwards, it's going to create rapid forward acceleration. So on the next step, instead of being, there will be a 50% maximum velocity. So if he's travelling at like 7 metres per second on step 2, if he was able to be in the air for a metre per second, he travels 7 metres with one step. He's not because he's in the air for 0.123 per second. But still, his, his stride length is related to how fast he's going, not to how much he's stepping in front of himself, how much he's pushing behind himself. Okay? So that's the position of the angle of the shin. Look how low this foot is on, this, on the back leg. It's like dragging on the floor. They actually emphasise this in Jamaica. I don't necessarily think it's a... Uh, you don't think you have to do that way. But I think it definitely doesn't help, it doesn't, doesn't hurt to do it because it encourages you to keep your foot close to the floor. You also want to touch the floor in real life because you can slow yourself down. But, you see how low it stays to the floor? Now, here he, he's, I told you one of his legs is in his good height. So at the point of maximum knee flexion, he probably ideally should have his shin angle more like this. But at least when he's going to hit the floor, his foot's going to be travelling backwards on the next step. Okay, see he's travelling backwards, see he's travelling backwards, look where he's landing. He's landing one metre from his last step, maybe one and a half metres. Shin angle is still negative. Okay, look what his arms are doing. They're still pretty high above his head. Okay, because they still have to compensate this long push out of that. Next one. Again, still like, you know, a ground contact system, chin still pushing for pointing forwards. In my model, it's maybe more gradual than this, but this is real life, you know, not everyone can get it right every time to do something. If he was going to run a world record, it would be more negative, I think. This is obviously just the practice start. And look how low this shit is here is when it comes past. When it crosses, an ankle cross, look how bent his leg is. Okay? Better athletes, have, you know, it sounds, I don't want to go into all the details, it would be too complicated. Then the better athletes don't actually have their heel wide to their butt, they actually have an angle cross at this point and actually have bigger angles. And if you read Ralph's book, you can read it. He doesn't explain exactly how he'd get to do that or maybe even why, but he shows the dates there. Look at the next one. Still negative shin angle. Still negative shin angle. The next one, this is 12, this is 10 meters. It's going to start almost being horizontal, almost being vertical. And there you go, end of dry face. But look, his body's still forwards. And now, because he's projecting himself more vertically, his heels have come close to his butt because he's got, he's got more time to recover his leg. He doesn't need to get it back to the floor really quickly because now he's starting to run. And you see how much straight his leg is. He's stopped running now, basically, but you see how much straight his leg is when he hits the floor now? It's more like a spring, so his heels have come up more to his butt. So you can learn a lot just by looking at that. And look how smooth it is. Everything's like kind of, he's not changing much from stride to stride, but from the beginning of that air to that dry phase, through to the end of the dry phase, there's quite a lot of change, but it's happening very gradually. Okay. I know this seems like a lot to take in. But... <coughs>
in Canada is very popular there. And Richard Buffett and James Asali use it. It's called a rollover star. Okay, but you could use a three point star in America. Uh, they like to use a three point star instead. It doesn't matter which one you use, the key thing is to do the same thing every time. So, but the, the rollover star, you start in this weird position like that, and everyone goes, like, What is all this about? This is just so weird. Why are you doing that? Like, why are you starting like this? Why are you letting your arms hang down? Why are you doing this? It's just weird. And I say, Yeah, it looks weird. Does this look weird? No, it doesn't. It looks like a block star, and that's what you're doing. You're starting here, you're rolling into a block star position. Obviously, I'll be off the floor. And before, you're, before you get to that point where you put your hands down, you're pushing out and going into your first try. So it's like doing a block start, but the key difference is, when you do a block start, you have to lift your set of mats from the ground up into the air. Use a lot of energy doing that. You, know, you try squatting down, jumping from this position, you know, or squatting from this position and squatting, and you try squatting from this position. It's much easier up here. And therefore, if you're going to do, let's say, you're capable of doing 20 reps as fast as you can, doing a falling start, but if you did that from blocks, you might need to be able to do 15. It doesn't sound like much of a difference, that's 25%. If you can do 25% more volume for the same level of energy output, and you're basically doing pretty much the same thing. Also, I feel that athletes that start from here start to, turn, start to execute their reps in a more relaxed fashion, so they practice executing relaxed. Okay, so I'll go through the key points in a minute. It's really simple, you're trying to approximate the same thing you're going to block. So in the blocks, your lead leg is generally, when you measure your blocks out, you start on your line, you go back, I'm going to be two foot lengths, and you put your first block, and you go three foot lengths, and you put your second block down. So there's your line, and you go back, you know, two foot lengths, and like this. And that means that your heel is going to be lying on your toe, pretty much. So when we do this, we find a line, we put the front leg in front of the line, the back leg behind the line, so they're about the same position as they be in blocks. You lift your heel off the floor on the back leg, because it's going to be kind of off the floor at an angle on the, in the blocks. And in the block, your front ankle, your shin angle, this here is at 90 degrees. So your foot is at 90 degrees to your ankle. So you keep that front leg stiff. What that means is when you roll, you don't let your knee go like this, you don't let your knee bend over your, over your ankle. You keep this ankle stiff. So when you roll, you roll like this, not like this. If you can help me. Okay. So you set your foot up here, your back foot behind, nice base, you stay nice and relaxed. You have your shoulders over your knee, which is over your toe. We're going to watch Paul do this a hundred times again, wrong, so don't worry. You have to shake your arms out so you get yourself nice and relaxed, and you keep your head in line with your spine. Okay, so your chin is like this, and your head's not like this. It's in line with your spine. You stay nice and relaxed, and you lift your arms to here. The reason we do this is because we used to do them from here, we found that um, the athletes, because they're falling a short distance, they will be lifting themselves. They often find it, if they find it takes too long to lift their arm up, so we start with arms like a pen. And as you roll, you move the arm on the left hand side, on the lead leg side, forwards, and you run out of the um, apple one. It's that simple. But it is natural. So if you ever teach someone to do this, and I've started, I've taught every single person I've ever coached to do this, it will take them around six weeks before they're comfortable doing this. The point is, once you've got that six weeks done, for the next five years, or however long you're going to coach them for, every rep they can do is going to be pretty much the same. Yeah, you don't have to go back and tell them they're making mistakes and improve them. But once you've got over that initial learning curve, they can do it correctly. But you could use a three-point start or something else. The other thing I do is I start, when well, I teach them this progression, I start on my hip. Because when you roll forwards, if you really want to roll to 45 degrees, you're falling quite a lot and that's quite scary. If you raise the angle of the track a little bit, well now if you want to fall to 45 degrees, you've only got to fall, you know, instead of falling 45 degrees, you fall 30 degrees. So it makes it a little bit easier. Okay, so I always start from the hill, and that's what we did with Paul the other day. Okay. So this is kind of what it looks like. It's the direction on the hill. So look heel to toe, set up, bent, bent knee approximately on my just above 90 degrees in the front leg, forearms vertical, heads in line with the spine. This guy here when we started filming this, he had a problem with always tucking his chin in, so I was really trying to get him to emphasize his, his back position. Okay. So you just roll forwards. This is all slow motion, so it will take 10 hours to get to that thing. It takes ages to get there. Okay. So you roll forward, so when he starts off, you see how his, we go all the way back, slowly, slowly, slowly. You see how his shoulder is over his toe, yeah? Yeah? So he's, he's not, he's not like, when you start, you shouldn't be like off balance, you should be completely on balance. His shoulder is over his toe, yeah? 
and he falls. So his shoulder is significantly in front of his toe, significantly in front. At the point where he thinks he's going to fall over, he pushes off. Okay. Lead arm is the one on the side of the front leg, comes forward. Okay. Look at the shin angle at the point of maximum knee flexion. See how it's parallel with the uh, back leg? And then his foot should travel backwards towards the foot. Now notice how it doesn't really travel backwards. Notice how it travels forwards, yeah? That's a mistake. So now he lands, you see how he's travelling forwards? He's going to land in front of himself. Now you see how his body's moving through the air as well, right? So it compensates for a little bit. And this guy is, you know, he went like, I don't know, 10 or 7 or something. So he's pretty good. But you see now he's landing in front of his, I mean, he's basically made contact there, right? He's landing in front of his hip, so his hip's there, and his foot's there, okay? In order for him to push, he's got to wait for his hip to pass his foot before he can push. So all that time is wasted. If this was Usain Bolt, he's still only hit the floor, his foot's behind him. And it, like, he was gone. And this guy, if you count the number of frames he's going to take, it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven frames, who's there? He's a bot, he's got seven frames on this guy from step one. Doesn't sound like that much, but seven frames, one, five, five, four, one step, steps, it's huge. It's like 10 years, 15 years. Okay, and he pushes off. Okay. So his back position is better. But you see how he's reaching with that front leg. See, look at the angle of the shin. See how it's pointing directly downwards? So of course he's going to land in front of himself. You know, he makes up for a little bit here. Watch his hips travelling forwards and through the air. But still, he's pushing up the hill. Okay? But again, she starts up high. She rolls forward. Push it off. Give me a nice big arm. But now look at her shin angle. See how her foot doesn't really open up very much. It opens up a little bit more than that on the guy. But see how it's moving back towards the floor as it hits the ground? So now it's landing a little bit less in front of her hips. It's not perfect. And up the hill it's more difficult to do because you, when the hill is like this, you're actually going to land further in front of your snow mass. But now she's able to, and see how her foot pushes backwards towards the floor a bit? How it's travelling backwards, it's not opening up as much as his was. It's sloping up a bit too much, not as good as his own pole. It's a little bit better, so she's able to push off. And she's run pretty quick, she's around like 11, 30. This is um, after like two weeks of me teaching these guys. So, uh, not perfect. He used to be doing the same thing. See how shin, his thighs point forwards, now he finds himself, he's having to wait before he pushes off. And you know, he's got some elements that are good, like you can see his foot starting to move backwards towards the floor. Ground contact. So that's starting to move backwards towards the floor rather than forwards on the first guy. And that means he's going he's to push off a little bit quicker. You know, like, look at that. His heel is, is you know, his heel is, uh, is still in front of his hips compared to you, anyway, his foot pattern like him. So you can see how people will make mistakes. And I'm showing you this because it's not like it's a natural thing to do. Uh, I was teaching her this for a couple of weeks before. So she's rolling through. So you can see she's rolling. She's got the idea. She's rolling. See how she's keeping that front ankle stiff? When we talked about that? She pushes off. Okay. Now, you notice a few things here. She's using her hand really well. Like it's coming up here. Because she's got a head touch, it's going to make her rotate forwards more than what maybe she should do. And because of that, she's going to have to overstride a little bit to stop herself. But it's not too bad. You know, look at the point of maximum deflection. You see how the, it's not parallel, so we've worked on that. But she, her foot's kind of travelling backwards towards the floor a bit, standing behind, in front of herself. But, you know, so she's now like 80. She went to the World Junior Championships for, and World Youth for. But do you notice that every single person that did that, they kind of look the same, even though they've been going for two weeks? So it shows you can teach someone to do something, and you can teach them to be consistent. They generally will look the same. Everyone has a slightly different style of doing something, and that's because that is, a, you know, just like when they run up, they've got their own slightly different style. So we've got the same girl here that we saw in the, uh, in the video before doing the three-point style. And you 
can see the same kind of things. So arm should, arm should maybe a little bit higher. Because her arm's so high back here, she rotates forwards towards the floor quite a lot. And you see how her foot's landing behind her, how she's pushing back. Still, her shins, her shins swing out a little bit more than maybe it should do. But she's pushing back to walk behind her. She's not letting her legs swing out as much. And you see how the shenan is slowly transitioning as she's going forward. Where does she finish her drive phase? Probably the next drive, yeah, about there. That's the end of her drive phase with her. And this is a girl running 11, 30, something like that. So she's making, taking five strides, not seven. And then she's starting to transition, still a bit forward by me. So one of the things I do to teach starts is do what's called a push-up start. And you just get them to push up and run. And when I get them to push up and run, they're starting to get the idea of what they should be doing. They're still they're creating negative shin angles. This girl I've only just started. But it gives you an idea of, like, some, of some of the things we're going to go through today. A drill is clearly not the same as running. I mean, you know, it's just not the same. But you can start to uh, feel the kind of key things that you're trying to get the athletes to do by doing a drill. So if you do drills at the start of each of your running sessions or each of your sprinting sessions as kind of warm up, you can emphasise the key things that you want them to do in a in a, in a session, just in, in as drills. Okay. And the main thing I think drills are useful for is, is posture. So we're going to start with a really simple drill. Okay. And, and all this is, is you're going to start nice and tall, with your arms nice and relaxed in a tall posture. This is the basis of all sprinting. And what you'll notice is when you accelerate, your body should stay in, in what's in you call neutral alignment. This is neutral alignment. So your head's not stuck forward, your butt's not out, you know, you're not leaning to the side or leaning forward. Your head should stay in a neutral alignment. So your tim is not tucked, it's not pushed back, it's in a neutral alignment. And when you accelerate and you move through that range, that acceleration, when you start, you might have your body looking trying like this. And as you come up, your head stays neutral. It doesn't go like this to this or like this to this or anything like that it stays in neutral alignment all the way through you're running okay so that's what we're going to emphasize one of the key things having a neutral alignment of the body okay the second thing is all the movement happens around your shoulders and around your hips so when you're going to swing your arms your arms are going to move from your shoulders you're not just going to do this okay you're going to try and swing your arm from your your shoulder okay and we're going to do leg movement as well so all we're going to do is start on the spot and we're going to walk. And we're going to walk forward like this. We're going to, you know, do like a walking high knee drill. And we're going to walk forward. And the key thing I want you to think about is, you see, when I walk forward, I take like half a step forward at each time. So I'm trying to put my foot back down underneath my body. Okay. So the idea is not to go forward as far as far as you can, uh, as quickly as possible. You want to just stay here, nice and tall, and then just walk forward like this. Okay. And we're going to do it up to about where I'm standing. So if you guys have a go at doing that, and then we'll pick some points out that we can work on. Okay. Now that we're all going to do it perfectly because I spoke to them yesterday. Okay, Paul, I want you to do it wrong with the ankle, please. Can you try and do it wrong with the ankle? Just have your foot in my ankle. Okay, here you go. You're going to keep doing that belt working. Okay. So, okay, so we've got some guys who are doing some good things, okay? So this guy here is really good. So if you just hold that position. So he's doing some great things. He's swinging the back of his shoulders, he's got a nice high hand, he's got a dorsi foot, flex foot. Okay? And also look at his ankle position. His ankle is behind his knee. Now if we look at Paul, we can relax. When he's doing it, he's doing the same drill, but he's doing the classic thing everyone will do, which is his foot's in front of his, his, his knee. And you remember when we talked about that whole leaning forward and having the foot like this? It's the same thing. If you're trying to encourage your athlete to keep what I call keep the foot contained in this kind of rectangle under their body, and you're doing that in drills, they're more likely to do it when they do it in their acceleration. Because they can start to think about and feel what's happening with their foot. So the foot should be under their knee. Their knee should not be above 90 degrees, because if it was, they'd be leaning backwards. Okay. Yes, good sprinters have a high knee lift. They have a high knee lift because they're good sprinters, not because they're trying to lift their knees high. Okay. That's an important point. All right. So the knee's not quite above 90. The foot's under the under the knee, so it's not here, and it's not like this. And the toes aren't pointed. The toes are up, and it's there. Okay. And they're nice and tall when they're swinging about the shoulders. That was pretty good. Okay. So let's go back. In. We'll do another one. It was so good that time we'll move forward, okay? Same thing again, but now they're going to go up on their toe on the foot that's uh, in contact with the ground. I'm not going to demonstrate very well because I'm not used to doing this, but like this, stepping forwards and forwards. 
Okay? And again, they should move forward a small amount. They shouldn't be going like this. Because you want your athlete to put their foot back under their center of mass. Wherever they're accelerating with at top speed, their foot's going to land pretty close to their center of mass. So if that white line's my center of mass, a top level sprinter, the best females land about 20 centimeters ahead of their center of mass. Top men and male, it's about 20, uh, 24, cent, uh, 24 centimeters. Okay? And then the worse they are, the more further in front they land. So if you're starting to do this and land here, that's much more than my foot's like 30 centimeters. And then if the white line's my center of mass, that means they're landing miles ahead of their center of mass. Okay? So you want to encourage them to put their feet back down underneath them when they're doing it, which means not going far, too far forward. Don't give them 100 meters of this stuff to do, because then they'll, they'll just do it like this all the time, because they want to get there quickly. So I just use five meters for this drill. So same drill, but this time going up on your toe. So it just gives a bit of balance to this exercise. It just shows a way you could uh, make it more complicated for the athlete once they get bored of doing a flat foot one. Should we have a go at doing it? And now because they're closing off on their toe, they're probably going to make mistakes with other parts of their technique. So then you can correct the other bits they're doing. It's difficult, I haven't done it before. But these guys are yeah, pretty good to you. So they're screwing about their shoulders, but you see how some of them are like lifting their shoulders they got, as they go up and down, they should keep their shoulders nice and relaxed. This guy at the end, he might be not thought of flexing his foot, so you could ask him, what are you doing with your foot? Why don't you think about coming down so you have a nice flat foot as you come down? <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, what else did we do? Oh, we did the running one, yeah? So then we're going to uh, make it a little bit more difficult by adding more motion. So we're going to do just a running high knee drill. So it's the same thing, but now you're just going to run See how I'm trying to stay as relaxed as I possibly can as I'm running, as I'm going up and down. And again, it's not about track covering as much ground as possible, because when you do that, you're going to encourage them to put their foot down and push out behind them to create that negative shin angle, and they're going to start leaning forward, and they're going to start doing something that's different to what they'd be doing if they're running upright, which is what these kind of drills are starting to kind of work on, okay? But all the same cues we were using before. Nice tall body, relaxed shoulders. Let's have a go. Okay, so straight away, look at what Paul's doing. You see how his hands aren't coming up very high? <laughs> and now he's changed. So the key points are right. They're trying to put their feet down under their body, close to their center of mass. They're trying to keep tall. They're trying to swing about their shoulder, not about their elbow. And they're trying to let their arms come towards their, towards their nose. And they're up this high. They're not feeling like what Paul's doing to start with. They're trying to encourage this. When you're not running at maximum velocity, you don't need to bring your arms up. Like distance runners don't run like this, do they? So when they're doing drills, it's not it doesn't feel natural to have your arm swing being very high. It's something that we can encourage because we want them to focus on that. So when they go to do the, the sprinting, we can we can work on that. All right, great. So that's just a few drills. But you see those couple of things that I was talking about, about the shin and about the foot coming down beneath them. It's the same as what we do in acceleration. That's why I'm showing you it. So come forward to the line. The first thing you teach them is say, what's the first front foot in blocks? Your left foot, okay? So your left foot, I'm going to stand sideways so you can see it. Your left foot is in front of the line, your right foot is behind the line. Okay, like that. So if you step and step like that, left foot in front, right foot behind. So that's pretty much the same as what his block settings will be. You've maybe got a little bit more space because, you know, he's got to have some balance when he starts. But the line gives you a nice, even, consistent starting point. Okay? From this position, he's going to stay nice and relaxed. He's going to bend his front leg. So, I don't know, maybe it's 100 and 110 degrees or something in the front leg, okay? And the weight is going to be evenly, just fairly evenly distributed for his legs, but his back heel is going to be off the floor. Okay, so let's try and get that. Good. And his shoulders are over his knee and over his toe. If anyone wants a strength conditioning coach, you know, when you're jumping or whatever, you're, or you're landing a jump, whatever, you're going to allow them to land their shoulders over their knees, over their toes, so they can jump. Okay, it's natural human movement to be like that. So it's the same thing that we're here. I always get them to relax their arms and shake them out before they start because I want them to just relax before they start. Yeah, that's the only reason for doing that. Now they bend their arms like this, so the arm is approximately in line with the surface they're running on. So if running up a hill, the arms will probably be a little bit more bent, but here is going to be good enough for him, okay? And he's going to try and keep his head in line. To keep his head in line, he's got to use his eyes to look down at the track. Because if I tell him to look at his feet, he's going to tuck his chin. If I tell him to look at the grass over there, or the trees over that house, he's going to look up, right? So, you know, get him to choose a point on the floor about here where his head's in line. And that'll encourage him to keep his head in line. Okay? So that's the starting position that he's going to try and achieve. And that's the first thing to teach him is that. He could maybe squat down a little bit more, have a go at squatting down a little bit more. But if his calves are really tight, 
he's not going to be able to squat because when you squat, your your shins have to come forward, right? If you've got someone with a tight calf and they try and squat, they're going to fall over. I actually had a guy that was so stiff once that when he squatted down, he fell backwards. <coughs> we went to a physio because I wasn't sure why this was happening. And I got him to squat and he fell over in the middle of the physio room, literally fell on his back. And surprisingly, the physio didn't actually realise it was calves that were tight. He said it was his hips. But after a few you know, weeks of trying this out and getting his hips looser, I realised it was his calves were tight. So that's something to think about. So Paul should be able to get into the position. The first thing to do is just to get them so they feel natural doing that. And once you get used to it, it's quite a natural position to be in. Okay? Cool, that's great. Let's have a go with you, sir. So try and achieve the same position. Just have a go at getting into it, and then we can correct you. So this guy, hopefully, he's got his right foot forward in the blocks. Okay, cool. Try and get in the start position. Just let your hands hang down a sec. Okay. So he probably needs to bend his um, knees a little bit more. Okay, a little bit more. Good. And you see how he's sitting down, so his chin's got to move a little bit more, so it's in line with his head. So your eye right is probably what here, my feet? Yeah. Some of this, right? That's a good point. Everyone is slightly different depending on their flexibility, etc. So for him, that's what he's going to be like. His arms are nice and relaxed, his heels off the floor. He's going to try and keep his ankles stiff. He's going to bend his arms to about here. And maybe lean him forward a little bit more. Just relax, yeah, just relax. It's not too, you know, it's not too important what his arms are doing, really. Okay? That's pretty good. Right. Relax. It looks a bit like a T Rex, it looks a bit weird. Do we have a go with him? <laughs> Good. good, it's pretty good. Just to heal off the floor a little bit. That's it. Cool. These guys are actually quite good at getting this position because they've seen it on the video and, and you did it yesterday. You did it yesterday? Yes. Yeah, you did it yesterday. No, no, sorry, no. Oh, you haven't done it? You don't know anyway. Okay, cool. So these guys are actually quite good at it. If you show them a few videos of it or something before, if you can do that, it helps the athlete to get in their mind what's going on. Normally we teach this on the hill, okay? So having achieved that position, okay, the next thing we're going to get them to do is we're just going to say to them, I want you just to roll forward until you feel like you're using balance and then I want you to run out. So let's have a go at doing that. That's all. Right. Let's all have a go at doing that. Only running. just to roll forwards and when you feel like you're losing balance, you're going to run out. So remember, we might, I'm saying, remember I said we're going to spend six weeks doing this. I literally might spend doing this. This might be day one. Okay? All right. Yeah. okay. You'll notice a few things, like he's over rotating and stuff. Now remember that. Okay. Sore from he's, injured, he's injured or sore from yesterday. So let's have a go at four, let's do one more each. So the first session, all you're going to do is you're going to get them to correct their position that they're starting with, and you're going to just get them used to like running out. Now, if they do it on the heel, it'll be a lot easier because they won't feel like they have to fall as far and they won't fall over. So it'll be a lot easier. But we'll just do it here so you guys can see. So let's have another go. So when Paul starts, you know, you're going to be correcting. You see how he's leaning forward his chest a little bit more. He could maybe sit up a little bit more there. Bend his knees more. Good position with his head. Okay. Let your arms relax and hang down. Good. And now bring them up. Again, you, you, before they go anywhere, you want them just to get in the, in the start position, like it's on your marks position almost. And you see, this time he's actually lifting his heel off the floor, so it's as as you maybe. So that's not a bad position. Okay? His head, this is a great position for him, he's looking really good. Okay? A little bit more knee bend, try a little bit more knee bend. Okay, that's okay. Okay, he was better than he didn't fall over as much. So day one would literally probably be you're going you're to spend ages doing that, then you're going to teach them that, and then you're going to do, I don't know, 10 to 15 times. 10 meters up a, up a hill, okay? That's it, that's day one. You've probably done your warm-up, you're gonna do some conditioning, you're gonna do whatever else you can do in that session, but that would be day one. All right, so the next thing to think about is that when you fell, when you fell, what were you thinking about when you rolled forward and went? Was there anything you were thinking about specifically? <laughs> so you were thinking about splitting his arms, okay, so that's, that's a good thing, right? So the reason he rolled, he, he fell forward a lot in the first one that he did is because when, when he rolled forward, he pushed everyone always Throws their, upper, their rear arm backwards, the one on the back side, on the leg on the side of the back leg, they always throw it backwards because it's natural to do. Okay? And what that does is it creates a lot of rotation. You see when I do that, how it makes my chest go forwards? And then their centre of mass is in front of them a lot and they'll start to stumble, okay? So to, to counteract that, you have to do something with the other hand, the hand on the side of the front leg. Okay? And this is the one that you want them to focus on. Because everyone does this naturally, the back hand side, you want them to do the front hand side. If you talk to American coaches, they'll talk about front side and back side mechanics, and it seems all really complicated. All they're saying is you should do as little as possible behind your body and as much as possible in front of your body. Taking that idea through to here, 
you want to focus on the things going on at the front side of the body, and there's the lead arm, not the back side. Okay, not the back arm. Okay, so we do the same thing, but this time when they roll and run out, we're going to encourage them to move their lead arm to above their head. It's got to be above their head on the first try, okay? If it's here like he was to start with, they'll rotate forward too much, and then they'll stumble. Okay, so lead arm above the head here. That good. Thing, nitpicky here. So the cord, his left hand is going to move first. Okay. And you want that hand to go forward. Okay? Now, when you're doing a block start, think about it. If you lift your hand off the floor, you're going to fall on your head. So you have to push out the blocks. So if you're going to get someone to think about anything, just think, ask them to lift their hand off the floor and then they'll have to go. So it's quite a nice way of teaching someone. Like Most people can do it naturally, but if they, get, they can't do it naturally, a nice way to get someone to react to the gun well is you say, when the gun goes, just lift your... We'll focus on what your lead hand's doing. Because whatever your lead hand's doing, as soon as that breaks contact with the ground, they have to go. Otherwise, they're going to fall over. So they will naturally explode out the blocks. Okay? So from here, this would be my lead hand. And I would focus on putting that above my head. So it would be there, which is what you saw from Usain Bolt. Okay? So what you're looking for if you're slowing it down on slow motion is looking for his hand to be kind of like above his head here because his other hand is definitely going to be back here. In fact, a lot of people have their arms straight, so it's really high above their head, okay? So it's going to be, it's going to be there. That's what you're looking for, okay? So this is like lesson two, or step two, maybe on session three or something, you do this. So. Oh, that's too much. Okay. All right, so he did it pretty well there, but he still stumbled, okay? And there's a couple of reasons why he, why he did that, that we can go into later. But one, one of the reasons work. he fixes is he also drops his chin, okay, which, which will cause you to rotate forward a little bit more. But that's probably not the main reason he fell, but unless I have video, I can't tell it apart first, yeah? Because what they do at the beginning affects what they do for the rest of it. So his heel is on the floor, yeah? So he's lifted here slightly. So, Spikes would be a lot easier because he, he would be able to grip the track easier. Very good. So that would be session two. It's okay, I think. That's good. That's a great starting position. And they probably won't stumble that much if you do it on the hill because the hill gives them a gradient, encourages them to accelerate. Okay? So actually, let's just have a go and do that run up the hill and see if it looks better. We might as well do that now. So we're going to have a go at it the same thing. Now, because this is like a 5 or 10 degree slope, they don't need to fall as much. So the key thing to say to them when they start off is, is you don't need to fall very much, because otherwise they will try and fall a lot and they'll probably hurt themselves. Okay, so. Don't need to fall as much, Paul. Does that look loads better than you know there? So you can see how it's just easy for them to do it. Okay. So if you do this for six weeks, that's 18 sessions, and three times a week, let's say. I might literally just do like 20 reps over dis different distances, usually quite short, because all I'm focusing on is the first bit to start with. And I might go and do some strength training, or some circuit training, you know, or go and do some grass, you know, grass runs, or something else afterwards, but if I just do it consistently... First thing is setting up the position, getting them nice and relaxed and they're doing everything, keeping their head in line. No one's really had the problem of tucking their head. Like, you'll see so many athletes that will do that. Um, they'll tuck their head, they'll have like rounded shoulders, they'll do all that kind of stuff. You'd have to go and correct that before you move to this next step. But at that point, you're just trying to get them to look like that this guy looks on that last hill. If they can look like that, that's pretty good. So we've got the position initially good, we've got them used to falling forward and running. Okay, we've got their head in line, we've got their eyes looking at the right point. Okay, that's important. We've got Then we've worked on the lead arm. So if your left foot's forward in the block, it's your left arm that goes forwards, yeah? It's not your right arm. Everyone always thinks it's your right arm. It's your left hand that goes forward, okay? And it's moving from here to above your head. It can sweep like this, like like this, okay? Or it can break and go out to the side like this, with the elbow out to the side. It doesn't really matter as long as it goes above the head because it's creating that counter movement force, okay? Um, I don't know which is better. Some people say it's better to break your elbow out to the side. Some people say it's better to be linear. I don't really have an opinion on that because I can't scientifically tell what's better, but. 
Certainly, I think if they're really explosive, it's probably better to bend your elbow because it just takes less time. You know, from here to here is quicker than doing that. So the next thing we're going to work on is the thing that we talked about a lot in the videos, which was where is your foot landing relative to your center of mass? And the oh, don't, not that bad. So the next thing to do is to teach them to think about what their feet are doing. Now, remember when we talked about we're doing those um, high knee jaws that we talked about putting the foot underneath them? This thing's in the way, I guess. But hopefully, you can see me. You can get them just to lean forward. It's, it's better against the railing or something like you have at a track. You can get them to lean forward at the, tr at the track. Try and get their body in a straight line so their bum shouldn't be out of that. And they shouldn't be like, I can't do that anyway because I'm too stiff. And they shouldn't be like that. They should be nice and straight. Head should be in line. And when they reach, reach their knee forward, you see my shin angle? You see that they should be hopefully parallel if I'm doing it right. So they shouldn't be like that. They shouldn't be like that. You can just get them to find that position and then push back behind their body, okay? And then the other leg. Push back behind their body. Okay? This kind of movement. Yeah? So you're, you're keeping the, what I say, you're keeping the leg contained. You're not letting the ankle cast out like in a like fishing. You're not letting it cast out in front of the body. You're not letting it go like this. Yeah? You're just here. Push back. It's a piston action. It's that simple, okay? Now, if you had one of those, probably see rugby players have it, they have like a thing that they push, like a bobsled thing they push. They can practice actually running and pushing back behind themselves and trying to do this dynamically. So you could use something like that to encourage them to do it dynamically, but in a static position, you know, this is just a nice simple drill to get them to think about that. And if they've got problems, you can just get them to do a few of these against the wall before they do their, their run. And it's just, it's trying to encourage them to do the right thing, okay? Now, how far their foot lands behind their centre of mass, we talk about this, is related to how strong they are. If they're really strong, if they use a bolt, they can land miles behind their centre of mass and they feel absolutely fine. If they're a young kid and they're not very strong, they want to land underneath or even in front of their center of mass because they, they need to be strong enough to push themselves up in the air again. And Usain Bolt can do it with this much movement because he's that strong. Whereas a little kid might need to have this much movement to do it. So even though you want to teach them to do the right thing, you can't expect a 12-year-old or a weak 28-year-old to do the same thing Usain Bolt can do. You can't expect it to happen. You want them to encourage them to try and do the right thing. So if they're landing here in front of themselves, you want them to get them to land here. Yeah? If they're landing here, you want them to learn to land here. But you're probably not going to get them to go from here to here in like one session, one year. You know, it's probably not going to happen. You're trying to make small incremental change changes to their performance over time. And when they're really strong, when they're really in good shape, when they're not injured, when they feel fresh, they'll do it correctly. So early in the season, they probably won't be as good as they would be before competition, for example. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the first thing is he's got a wonderful derriere. Yes, <laughs> okay, so we want to try and get a nice straight line. We want to get his head in line as well. We don't want him having his chin tucked. And, and you know, I mean, you know, you can put like a, a some kind of, you know, you, I used to use my hand here, but you could always use a stick or something just to encourage them to have that Sticks position. Good. Yeah, you just, I mean, I'm not encouraging you to beat your athletes or anything like that, all right? But, you know, we should have, you know, like this. Okay. Well Maybe hips down a little bit more. Cool. Yeah, that's good. There you go. Good. This is t-shirt. It's not with bare belly. All right, and uh, and then you can have a go at doing the drill. So bring your knee forwards and back. Okay. So what's he doing wrong? Kicking his foot forward. Too far. Kicking his foot forward. Okay. So you want to try and encourage them to keep this here. If it comes forward a little bit, it's probably not a massive problem. But when they're doing it slow, they should do it right because there's no like there's not there's no reason for them to do it wrong. Okay. So it's just like gymnastics. You know, you can teach anyone to do this right. Doing all the tracks a different thing, but at least they should be getting it right when they're doing this kind of thing. Let's have a go again. Good. Okay, what's going on wrong? What's wrong now? <laughs> what's going wrong now? What's going wrong now? He's flicking his heel up behind him, okay? It's not a piston action, okay? So we wanted to get it to piston action. Let's try a piston action. Yeah. <laughs> So you want to get him to get in, encourage him to have his head head in line. Okay, cool. All right. Now, not bad. So you could probably put drop your hips for a little bit. More. Yeah, that's better. It is going to be difficult. Guys, they tend to be, um, guys tend to be tight to the hip flexors. So they tend to find it hard. I mean, I definitely do. Okay, that's the okay. So it's not bad. But you see how his foot's kind of swinging out a little bit more. You can encourage him not to do that quite as much. He doesn't have to have quite as high a knee drive. That's more fun. Bend the knee to create 
range of motion over which to create the force. But you don't need to do this to do that, yeah? It only needs to be enough so you've got somewhere to create the force. And you know what I was talking about how um, uh, good athletes might have high knees? They have high knees because they can create more force off the floor, so their foot bounces up and comes up higher than, uh, than less good athletes. It's not because they actually bring their knees up higher or try to do it. Alright, so that was good. So we had a go at doing that. Now the idea is to come back and do the same drill again, the same falling start, but encourage them to try and push backwards with, their, with the first step. Okay, so let's have a go. So remember, everything should be right when he starts, yeah, so he's got a good position, so I'm not going to correct him. But I would correct him if he was wrong. Okay, so we're trying to encourage them here to cue them to put their first foot back pretty much where they've come from, okay? So we don't want them to land here. Do you remember Usain Bolt was like, if he was starting behind the line here, he was landing like here. Remember, his feet are actually back here because he's got long legs, yeah? But he's still not traveling that far in front of the line. So you don't want this guy to be like landing here on their first stride. You want to try and, it's, you don't want to tell them to have a short stride because it's not really a short stride. It kind of has negative connotations. But if that's what you have to tell them to make them do it, then you tell them you need a short stride. They need to put their foot close to the line. That's what I'd like to say to them. So have a go, and, and notice they'll do some, um, they'll, when they try and do this, they'll probably have a, a, an issue that will come up because of it. I have a feeling that he's stepping a little bit further forward in front of himself than he needs to, I think he could be a bit better. But also he's wearing trainers, if he wears spikes, it'll be much easier for him to put his foot behind him because he's not going to... So step... So we had those steps. We go for the steps. Set up the position. Get that good. Get them relaxed. Get them rolling forwards. Then focus on the lead arm. Then talk to them about the leg. This might be session five or six. Talk to them about the feet needs to land close to the, uh, the, tra uh, the line. On the first step is what you're focusing on to start with. Now what happens when they do it right? What happens when they land close to the line? Well, what happens now is their centre of mass is significantly in front of their base of support. And because of that, if they're not very strong, they're going to take a long step on their second stride. So they're going to take a short step and then a massive long step to catch themselves because they've come out so low to the floor compared to what they're used to. Okay? The next progression will be trying to work on not taking a long second step. Once they've got the first step close to the line, the next one will be trying to work on not taking a long second step. Okay? Because it's quite scary to be that close to the floor when you start with, start off with. Okay? One of the key ways to stop that is to make sure that you have a big enough arm. Okay? And the second arm should also be fairly big, because if it's not, they're going to be close, they're going to be uh, rotating forward, they're going to feel close to the floor, and they're going to step further in front of themselves. Like if you're walking along, and you see this, but you don't see the bag and you trip, you know, you step in front of yourself, right? It's called a stumble reflex. And the reason you trip is, and the reason you shoot your leg forward is because it's a reflex. So if you feel your, your weight is in front of your center of mass, you're going to step forward automatically of your front leg. So to teach them to overcome that is quite, it's quite difficult. So the only way they're going to do that is if they got, pretty much if they've got spikes on. So you wouldn't better teach them to work on the second step until they've got spikes on. And just to point this out, it might take you like two or three years to actually get the second step to do it properly. It's not like it works overnight because, because once they've got the first bit right, it's so difficult to get the second and third and fourth steps right that it's going to be something you're constantly working on. And, and when they're out of shape or they've had a little injury or they're not as performing as well, they'll probably struggle with this. And one of the key problems with focusing on technique all the time is people get what's called paralysis by analysis. They go, oh my God, my second step was terrible. I'm never going to run a good rate. It's like, in the context of things, it's not that important. But you still want to aim for perfection. So you don't want to get it into their mind that it's so important that they can't do anything else just because they had a bad second step or a bad first step. Okay. So you're going to set up and you're going to try and put your first foot close close to the line. You don't want to make it, I, like, I don't make this like a massive part of my session. I do it for like, you know, 20 minutes at the beginning. Then we do something we don't talk about technique so much. We don't want to overemphasize everything.
Okay, so he, he did that. That was pretty good. Okay, that wasn't bad at all. Not bad, but do you see he's taking, he's still, he's got this like, this kind of movement. Your foot wants to be traveling back towards the floor as you hit the floor. So it's here and then back, okay? So I reckon for him, he can probably land about here. And, you know, if I put this down or something, he can probably land about here. And I think he's landing a little bit further and forward. I don't want him to focus on anything, so I'll probably use this for my, uh, for me looking at stuff rather than for, for them. At, at Loughborough, we actually have a, uh, every meter marks on the track for the first 30 meters with a little piece of white tape and if you're at a track that you can do that you can just put a piece of masking tape on the track and then if you film it you can look at the film and you can go oh that's you know where you're landing and that's really good especially like i teach long jump and, and triple jump it's great because you can see the length of the strides going into the board and stuff so it's really worthwhile to put a bit of tape on the track every meter or whatever so you can analyze this so let's have another go paul and let's see if we can work out where his first foot is landing just for ourselves as coaches we wouldn't put this marker like so they can see it otherwise they'll focus on the mark and what they're doing but again you focus on the first things first now one thing i want to change with paul is when you bring your arms up you kind of have a real tight angle here just have them a little bit more loosened in front like that but okay so he's there So just when he's doing each one, you could just use that and try and encourage him to take a little bit shorter stride. A little bit shorter. Yeah, a little bit shorter stride. Push back a little bit more. Okay. So they're both in the same kind of position. They're both about here. Okay. So we're just going to work on getting that that foot behind them a little bit more on that first stride and that's what we do for a couple of weeks and then when they've got that then you're going to find the, se the second stride is a bit too long and then you're going to work on getting the second stride so that the shin angle is is negative and we could use the film to watch that we could look at all those kind of things yeah so as you get better the athlete can fall a little bit more they can work on the general idea of things and also as they get as they as they get more trained they're going to get better at this so the first session of the season you won't expect them to do it right but when they come towards competition they're fresher everything feels better they should be achieving better positions and remember you're trying to emphasize the overall thing you're not going to sit there and get really really bogged down the fact that you know it hasn't moved by two centimeters over the last eight weeks you're just getting to kind of consistently repeat things so what we do is we'd start off and we might do it on the hill Okay, for a couple of, you know, for six weeks. And we wouldn't just do 10 meters. We'd then work on 20 meters, 30 meters, up to 40, 50 meters up the hill. You know, so I might do five times 10, five times 20, five times 30, five times 40, let's say, just making it up. And on the other parts of it, we talk about the transition phase that I'm not gonna talk about today. That would be the bit where you're slowly raising your torso. So once the shin angle's at 90, you'd slowly raise the torso. And in those 30 and 40 meter runs, or those 20 and 30 meter runs for younger athletes, we'd be working on constantly bringing the torso up. So it's not like they spend all their time just focusing on this one thing and get paralyzed by it. And then we literally just move the distances out a little bit. And that's your progression. And you can just write down some ideas for progressions on a, on a piece of paper. And you can do that. And that can be your first 10 weeks of training for your acceleration. It can be just be slowly, gradually starting on hills, getting on hills, then coming back here, starting with 15 meter reps or 10 meter reps, building the distances out. So you start to create a progression over 10 weeks. And if you think about that, that's your, that's, your, that's your planning. That's your planning process. That's all you need to do for that. You, know, you don't need to worry about increasing the volumes or anything else. You just need to worry about them doing it technically correct. And it doesn't have to be 20 reps. It could be you know, five, six, seven, eight reps. And then you can do some of your other running that you want to work on. It's just, if you do that consistently all the way through, then over time they will get better at it. And then when they're better at it and they're doing their 150s, their 300s, they should, if they should probably be starting the same way. One thing is, obviously, if you're running your athletes together, they can't all do this start because it's not going to work because one person's going to go off and they're going to go miles for the other person. Everyone's going to get upset. It's not going to work, okay? So one of the things about my training is that I never let anybody run together when they're doing anything fast. Everyone does everything on their own. So that's not good for motivation. It's not good for doing a 600-meter rep or an 800-meter rep or something. 
But if you're doing a 150, maybe even a 300, and you're doing it quite quickly, then I find that's absolutely acceptable. And the reason I do it for them on their own is I want them to focus on what they're doing, not how far they are related to their friend in front or something else. Because as soon as you make it a race, everything goes out the window. They just do what they always did. So I want them to focus on themselves, and that's why I do things on their own. If they're doing slower runs or they're doing like stuff on the grass or whatever, then I put them together in, in packs, and I wouldn't get them to start this way. They might just jog into it, or, or they start at this, and I go three, two, one, they, and they go, or whatever. So, you're asking the question, why do people step out to the side, okay? And that's a good question, okay? And basically, they have to step out. Whenever someone does something in human movement, they do it because they're overcoming a problem that's set out, set out to themselves, okay? So, if I'm coming out of the blocks, I'm at this angle, and I want to put my foot down the track, I'm in a pretty strong position, okay? So I can put my foot fairly linear to me, yeah, because I feel, I feel quite strong, okay? If I've got a really low angle for the track like this, and they're asking me to put my foot in front of me, there's no room for me to do that here. So I put my foot out to the side like this, yeah? So if I ask, you know, you've got this and ask someone to put their foot in front of them, they're not going to do this underneath them. They're going to do this and put it out to the side, okay? So if someone leans too far forwards, or comes out at an angle that's lower than they're capable of generating force for, they will lift their leg and they will abduct it and put it out to the side to create more space between them so their knee's not too close to their chest. That's why they'll do it. So if they're not strong enough, or they're coming out too low relative to their strength, they will step out to the side. And if you watch world-class sprinters, they actually step out to the side on the first few strides because they're coming out at like 33 degrees from the block, so they haven't got enough room for their, their legs to be under their body. They have to step to the side. So some people would say that you're losing time because you're stepping out to the side. But in order to achieve that low angle of departure that they need to get the horizontal forces, they have to do it. And everyone at the top level does it. So it's a compensation they're doing that they need to do to achieve what they want to achieve. Okay? But if someone's really doing it and going like all over the place, then you need to ask yourself, are you encouraging them to come out too low? Is there something about the block settings that are making them come out too low? Are they not strong enough? Is it just that there's one of these people that's got really long legs relative to their body and they need to have more space? So if they're doing that, there's a couple of things you could do. You could, first of all, if they've got their hands really wide in the blocks, you could bring them a little bit narrower together so their hips are further off the floor. So obviously like this, you see how low my shoulders are. And if I bring my hands in, you see how my shoulders come higher? Yeah, that will raise my center of mass a little bit more. So that could help. The other thing is you might just be, they might not be doing this with their hands. They're coming out too low because they're leaning forwards. That's another thing to check for. Those would be the first two things I'd look at. And after that, I'd have to analyze it happening but about three centimeters out from the center line and I don't know what the stat is for the sprints because I haven't done it recently but I know for race walking because I was doing it last week that it's three centimeters out from the midline of their body okay so when you run and when you swing your arms your arms don't swing like this they swing slightly towards the midline of your body right because your shoulders are rotating and as you rotate your your body comes towards the midline when you run your hip starts here and it twists and it comes towards the midline so your knee naturally comes towards the midline you kind of land like if we were running, I'd probably run on this white line. My feet would land pretty much underneath each other, maybe slightly out from the midline, but pretty much there. Okay? So it's natural for his hips to swing in and his knee to come towards the midline. That's natural. That's just the way your hips move when you run. So there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Like, as a coach, you can't change absolutely everything about someone's technique because some of the things they're doing, they're doing it for a reason that you can't tell because you know, they've got a hip impingement or you know, maybe their hips are wider than someone else's hips, their hips are narrower than someone else's hips, their leg length is slightly different, or, you know, there's loads of different things that could be wrong with them, or could be different for that individual athlete. So you can't, it's difficult to say what is specific to them or what is a technical mistake. So just focusing on the key small things that you can do is the first thing to do. And to be honest, you know, a lot of the Jamaicans are doing great stuff, and I trust me, when I've seen their coaching and see what they do, it's not like they're getting masses of technical cueing, they're just very, very strong. They understand that they need to run relaxed and they understand they need to have good technique. And they look at their friends that are good and they go, that's good technique and they copy it. And they're not really getting great uh, coaching back to them, but they know all those things and so they're getting better because of that. If, but, but sometimes an athlete will do something completely wrong, but they won't use their arm like this, right? If you do not coach them to do that then, they will, will do that forever. I've seen athletes that are like 28 and doing that and making the mistake in the Olympic final. You're like, why are you doing that? All they need to be told is have their hand here and it would make a big difference to them. But that's the, the level of intervention you as a coach maybe need to make. The rest of it's just about being conservative and being progressive with what you're doing. So try and change the things you know that you think are wrong and don't worry so much about all the other little bits because 
Sometimes it's something the physio has to do to free their back up, and then they'll be able to do it. You know, like if, if they've got a natural tech posture like this, the first thing you want to do is, all the coaching cues in the world aren't going to change this if that's the way they are. You've got a guy, you know, relax their SCM, their sternocleidomastoid here at the front of their body. You have to get them to get used to this. You have to get their shoulders back. You do all that postural stuff. So when you see those physios and those people that are strength and conditioning coaches talk about that stuff, like that's worthwhile doing because if the athlete is like standing like this to start with, they're not going to run normally. As a coach, you've kind of got to work out what's naturally their technique, what's because they've got a dysfunction because of the way that their you know, muscles are tight or something, and then what's actually that they've learnt it wrong. Okay, does that make sense? The same with your arm movement. At top speed, your arms are doing this. You're not doing this. So when you first come out of the blocks, because you've got this long leg behind you, this distance behind you, this big, what's called backside distance, your hand, your arm action has to be big as well to compensate for that. As your leg action comes closer and closer to your center of mass, the arm action gets a lot smaller. On step three, your foot is landing under your center of mass if you use a bolt. In which case, you don't have to have your hand directly above your head. It has to be more like this. And as you go through each step, your hand action comes down and down and down, so it's your normal action. So it's going to be big action, big action. Now your foot's under your center of mass, so it's going to probably be here. It's still going to be fairly big to lean your forwards, and then it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller until it's back to your normal running action. So it, it, it compensates for your legs. His right arm, and for Paul, it's his left, above the head. So it would just be like this. Now don't rip your shot out of your socket when you do it, but let's have a, <laughs> let's have a go at doing that, okay? So just have a go at moving your hand above your head. Just have a go, yeah. Yeah, that other hand, uh, yeah, that hand, yeah, yeah, sorry. No. Yeah, try that, okay, and again. As fast as you can, let's go. Good, all right. So once they've kind of got used to that, and they've got used to that action, you can do something like for reaction time. So when you're in the set position, you should take a breath in, by the way, in case you didn't know. Most people do not actually, but you should take a breath in. So we could do a thing where I say, take your marks, and they assume that position. When I say set, they'll take a breath in. And then I say go, they'll move their arm. Okay? <laughs> Apart from the one that false starts. Okay. So we'll have a go. Ready? Take your marks. Set. Hop! There you go. I think Paul won that one actually. Okay, take your marks. Now, again, you want to make sure they're in the right position they're doing this, not just like randomly doing something that's completely different. Set. Hop! Cool. This guy here, I think you can actually let your arm like you can flick it more like that. Yeah, a little bit like that. Try and flicking that. It might probably make it a little bit quicker than what you're doing now. Okay, two marks. Set. Hup. See, he was quicker then, right? Because he's not doing this. It's a longer action to that than it is to this. Whereas Paul's doing this. Yeah. So you're just gonna, you can kind of flick it. I mean, I don't, when they're actually starting from blocks, they're probably not thinking what they're doing, so it's not going to be a flick. But you can get that idea from here, from this position. You can just flick to above your head, and then it will just be a natural driving action. Yeah, so that's when the elbow bends to the side and comes up.